Hebrews chapter 3 verses 12 to 13 chapter 4 verses 4 14 5 to 7 see to it brothers and sisters that none of you has a sinful unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Therefore, since we have a high, great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is sub subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins, as well as for the sins of the people. And no one takes this honor on himself, but he receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. In the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, You are my son. Today I have become your father. And he says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. We are so glad you are, I'm sorry, during the days of Jesus' uh, life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent, reverent submission. God's word for us today. I'm always amazed um, how songs get chosen. I mean, Jim and I and Peggy, we, we talk. Uh, they, get, they get a little short thing about what, um, what I'm going to preach on. <laughs> so we have Days of Elijah talking about a wilderness journey. And this section of Hebrews really says that our life as Christians is a wilderness journey. That there's something about living the life of Christ today that's in the wilderness. And then we got the offering song, Ain't Nobody Gonna Turn Us Around. And really what the author of Hebrews is telling the Hebrews is, don't be like them, or another way to say it, ain't nobody gonna turn us around. Because if you get turned around, you ain't gonna get the freedom land. You gotta keep your eyes on Jesus, you gotta keep on marching, you gotta keep on talking. That's what he's telling these Hebrews who are struggling and they're in persecution and they're, they're at a point, even though they came to Christ and you might have some theological issues that are going on in your head right now. They're, get, they're basically saying, I'm selling the farm. I'm out of this. I don't need this. If, I'm gonna, if Christ, God loves me so much, why is my life so difficult? Why do I have to do this? You know what? I don't need this in my life. I'm just going to go back to what I had before. It wasn't as painful. And there's times in your life where you just have to lay it down. You've got to say, ain't nobody going to turn me around. I'm going to keep on marching. I'm going to keep on talking, moving on to freedom land, eternal life, relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That's what Hebrews is talking about. And again, I'm just amazed that we sing these two songs that just filter into this text so wonderfully. God is good all the time. So I said it, life in this world is a spiritual journey, spiritually speaking, through the wilderness. And the only way we're going to make it through is found in chapter 5, verse 13, uh, that Bob read. Actually, I don't think that's the right word. But he Hebrews 3, chapter 3. And let me start out here. I'm going to go through this scheme. Why, what, who, how? Why, what, who, how? Okay? And I'll fill those out a little bit more. But in that verse, we find, uh, let me just read uh, verses 12 through 13. Watch out, brothers, 
so that you won't be in so there won't be in any of you an evil unbelieving heart that departs from the living God but encourage that's the word I want us to look at right now encourage each other daily while it is still called today so that none of you is hardened by sin's deception when was the last time you encouraged someone and I'm talking about a Christian we can be about encouraging everybody but Christians need to be encouraged encouraged daily that is a job that everyone who claims Christ as their Lord and Savior we are to be encouragers when was the last time you did that when was the last time you received encouragement this comes at the end of a section of verses that refer to the time when the children of Israel were, were between their experiences in Egypt they were slaves not treated it's never good to be a slave let me just say that and before they got into the promised land their inheritance that God had promised them, the place of rest, the place of freedom. So it's between slavery and freedom land. They're in the in-between time, and they're struggling in the wilderness. And the writer of Hebrews is going back to it. They're called, again, it's the wilderness. They are in that place called the wilderness. And because of where we live, we might be tempted to think of a place like the wilderness, like it's just filled with trees. Like Fargo, no, I guess Fargo wouldn't be a good place. But you know, lots of trees. That's not the wilderness in the Bible. The wilderness is like the Southwest, out and around El Paso. There's just nothing. It's just sand, rock, caliche, cact. I mean, it, there's just nothing. And it's not good to be in the wilderness. And the reason it's not good to be in the wilderness is there are no resources in the wilderness that are sustainable over time. You might find some water, but you're going to drink it all up. You might find some food, but, you know, Navy SEALs and Air Force guys, they do these survival training in the desert. You don't want to eat the stuff that they learn to eat because none of it looks appetizing. This is the, what the wilderness is like. It is not a place you want to camp out and stay in the rest of your life. It's just a transitory place. You want to get to the promised land. So the reality is far from the picture here. There's little shade, little water, limited resource and, and, uh, in which these folks can survive. So in verses, chapter 3, verses 7 through 11, let me just read this for a moment. So as the Holy Spirit says, Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested and tried me though for 40 years they saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation. I said, their hearts are always going astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declared an oath in my anger that they shall never enter my rest. They shall never enter my rest. That's a scary thought coming from the mouth of God. Exodus tells us what their complaint was in Exodus 17. They said, well, why did you bring us out of Egypt to make us and our children and our livestock die of thirst? They're in the wilderness, they're thirsty, and they're complaining to God. Why did you, well, we could have died just as easily in Egypt, God. Why did you bring us out here? That's what wilderness life gets like. And the Hebrew writer is basically using this text to tell these modern-day believers, these urban Christians who are under duress, and I would say us too, don't be like them in the wilderness. Don't be like them in the wilderness. See, when they're in the wilderness, it didn't seem like God was around a whole lot. You know, when they were back in Egypt, there was like a plague every day. There's 10 plagues, and you could just see them lining up along the Nile like, What's God going to do today? What's the plague going to happen today? What's going to happen? It's like, you know, wow, let's, let's watch, you know. And then when they get into the wilderness, yes, they got manna every day. They're getting fed. But you know what? If you're getting the same meal every day, just eat at McDonald's for 40 years. You might start out like, oh, just pick your favorite restaurant. Eat there for 40 years. By the, by the year 40, you're like, I don't want to see that. And I'm arguing it won't make, take 40 years. That's not a miracle anymore. Right? So, yeah, they're getting manna every morning, but it ain't a miracle anymore. They want to see stuff like, you know, 
hail that's flaming coming out of the sky. They want to see that kind of stuff. The river all blood red, that's what they want. But in the wilderness, they're not experiencing God that way. He's just some, he's there, but he's not there. They want to see something else. There was a plague every day in Egypt, but in the wilderness, it just seems like God is asleep. And life in this world, spiritually speaking, is a wilderness. How many of you have prayed for something and it appears to you that God's just not hearing you? How many of you ask the question when you see some things that go on in the world, What's, where's God anyway? You know, it's clear to me that after every major event that occurs, tsunamis, uh, tornadoes, tropical storms where lots of people get killed, I always hear folks say, this is why I don't believe in God. I, I can't believe in God. Where is he? Why didn't he stop this thing? Well, we're in the wilderness. We're living in a wilderness. So what does it mean? The resources were scarce in the wilderness and could not be counted on. For us, that means that cool stuff in our lives won't meet our deepest needs. You, we, you know, we're 21st century. Most of us are middle class. Life is pretty good. I'm not saying it's 100% because I believe ultimately, I don't care whether you're wealthy, middle class, poverty, you've got troubles in your life. No one is excused from troubles, all right? Because if, if they were, then that means there is, a, there is a heaven on earth. But I'm telling you right now, there is no heaven on earth. And everybody has an issue in their life. You just don't know about it. The wealthiest person on this planet, I'm telling you right now, has issues. And it hurts them to the core of their being. Maybe money helps them. I don't know. But no one is in a, in a place that's like Eden today. We are struggling. And if we're living in the wilderness, this is what it means. Like The stuff that we as Americans basically count on to make ourselves happy, our families, our success, our education, our positions, our money, our friendships, look, they're all great. I think you need them to, to get through life. But, but here's the deal. If you're depending on those sorts of things to meet your deepest need, it's not going to happen. You know, all those things are in the process of disintegration. The best marriages, the best marriages are in the process of hardening. Of, of maybe taking one another for granted. Uh, your jobs, you know, I just, you know, I just read, you know, you, I got a great job, it's a union job, and I've got everything, and then you find out because, because the, the economy is going a different way, John Deere lays off 20 people here in town. You are counting on that job, it's gone. Well, you know what? All the jobs at John Deere, or any major company in this country, or in the world, you don't know where you're headed. You know, my dad retired from the steel company. He had a medical plan, and before he died, they had changed that medical plan about 10 times. Each time he had less, more he had to pay for. There's no given here. So if you're putting all your hopes on those things, we're in the wilderness. It's like that watering hole in the wilderness. You can only drink from it so long, and it's going to be gone. The most beautiful face in the world is drying up and getting wrinkled. It's just going to happen. This face is going to get wrinkled. Can you believe it? I'm going to have even less hair. That's just what it is. So as life goes on, the miracles of God are fewer and far between in the wilderness. And more often than not, we seem to think that God's asleep. And it gets to be very hard to believe in God in that situation. And I have talked to some of you sometimes you're in life situations where it's very difficult to believe in God. That's not being heretical. That's just being true. Scripture defines, it says that. So we need counseling, encouragement, counseling to help us keep from getting hard. I'm not talking about, well, who knows, maybe at the end of this, everybody needs to make an appointment with Jim but, or, or you know, Dr. Grubb. But anyway, I mean, I'll unpack it. So that, that, is, uh, that is the why. Why do we need counseling? Number two, what do we mean by it? Okay, let me unpack this. Well, what do we, 
what is the counseling we need? Hebrews, if you read the whole book, is an up and down kind of a book. It's a roller coaster of emotions. Uh, the audience is composed of suffering people, and yet sometimes the writer can come across really harsh, really stern. And you kind of go, ouch, when you read it. Oh. Other times, the writer comes across with great, wonderful compassion and grace. But here's the deal. Uh, we might like one or the other, but we can't survive as human beings without either of those. So let me just break those down. You know, in John 11, we read about Mary and Martha and Jesus and Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha. And Lazarus has died. He's dead, past tense. He's, he's gone, just died. And the brother of the two women, and uh, he's a friend of Jesus, and he knows these two women, and Jesus gets word of his death, so he kind of ambles over to the city where Lazarus has died and Mary and Martha are. And it's interesting that in this story, uh, Martha comes to Jesus, and then Mary comes to Jesus. They both say the same thing to Jesus. Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Great faith, but they're kind of blaming him. Jesus, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And it, what's interesting is he doesn't answer them the same way. So they say to him the same thing. This is what he says to them. For Martha, he kind of comes back. He's kind of brusque with her. He says, I'm the resurrection and the life. What's your problem? Great theology, truth. Bam! Well, I know about the resurrection. But it's just like in your face, right? Mary shows up. And he, she says the same thing as Martha said. And what's his response to her? He weeps. He, he sees her. He sees it. He weeps. So what we need as human beings, we need ministry of truth, and we need a ministry of tears. Now, some of us are fixers, and some of us are feelers. And if you've ever had a fixer, intervene in your life, you probably didn't appreciate it. Because here's the deal, fixers need to demonstrate feeling. But if you're a feeling person, you know, oh, let me just give you a hug. And I'm kind of like, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> you also need to bring truth. The ministry of truth without tears can be brutal. And the ministry of tears without truth is sentimental. And what we see here in Jesus, he gives tears and he gives truth. In Isaiah 9, we, when, we, uh, when we look at Isaiah 9, 6, this is who Jesus is. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and he will be named Mighty Counselor. One of translator writes it this way, a supernatural heart changer. We need counseling that comes from tears and comes from truth combined can't be one or the other. So who are we going to get it from? This isn't really rocket science. Who do you think the answer is? Jesus, right? In chapter 4, verse 15, it says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tested in every way as we are, yet without sin. You know, we're the only, Christianity is the only religion where God is placed on the operating table and feels it. Every other religion puts God high up on a mountain. Doesn't really have the sense of what it means to be a human. How do you do truth and tears if you can't associate with the people you're ministering to? Our God came down. He's in Jesus Christ. He he can sympathize with our weaknesses. So, you know, you're not alone. That's what that text tells us. You're not, you don't, and I've been in this situation, you're sitting there, you're feeling blue, and you're like, nobody understands what I'm going through. Our great high priest understands. It says here that he has, he who is, he sympathizes with our weaknesses. But he's been tested in every way, as we are. Because, you know, when you're blue, when you're going through that time, it is a test. It's a test of your integrity. It's a test of your character. How am I going to respond to this situation? 
Am I going to blow up in anger? Because you know what? Anger makes me feel good and it helps me blow out of the blueness. And you know what? If I could just yell at somebody, I'll feel so much better. And I'll blame them for it. Even though it's probably my fault, I'm going to yell at somebody and blame them for my situation. Jesus never blamed anybody. And he rightfully, truthfully could blame somebody, but he never did. He was tested in every way as we are yet without sin. Think about this for a moment. Think, we lived in El Paso, Texas for a while, and over in Juarez, Juarez is a huge city. Uh, the, the economy isn't the best. Uh, you have really wealthy people in Juarez, and it's, there's no, like, no middle class. You have really, really poor people. And you even have a, a second group of poor people that they live on the dump. I know I've used this a lot of times. These folks wake up in the morning, work the dump, you know, look for food, look for things to sell, and then they go back to bed on the dump. That's where they live. That's where they get up. Think about a child who is growing up, living on the dump in Juarez. They're suffering, right? No doubt. They're suffering. But let me, okay, let, how much do they know they're suffering? If that's their life, how much do they know they're suffering? I was reading an interview this morning by... Uh, um, I forgot her name. Luongo, 12 Years a Slave. Uh, what's her first name? Anyway, she, she, she and Trevor, um, the guy who's on The Daily Show, he's from South Africa, she's from Africa, and they were talking when they were watching TV. What they were intrigued by was when they, they'd see on TV somebody come in and hang coats up on a coat rack, or they'd go upstairs. Because where they grew up, there was no upstairs, and there were no coats, let alone a coat rack. That was just... That intrigued them. When I read that, I'm like, what? You know, I watched Leave it to Beaver all the time growing up. It just seemed like regular life to me. But the idea being that there is a regular life that I'm totally unaware of. So, yes, it's hard to grow up in a dump. But get this. What if you were in the lap of luxury and you ended up living in the dump? Now you're suffering. You know where Jesus came. Paul's Gospels tell us that he was, he gave up being God, and he came down here. He knows what the lap of luxury is, in a way that we don't know what a lap, it would be like living on the mountain in El Paso. In the mountain, there's mountains in El Paso, and you can get a house way up on the mountain, and it's going to cost you an arm and a leg and a lung and a foot and who knows what else. Assume you're up there looking down on everybody. You know, anytime you got a house that looks down on somebody, you know you're going to shell out a lot of pesos. What if you're up there and now you're in the dump in Juarez? What, what if you have a great job and the next thing you know is you have to apply for food stamps? I would pray that that doesn't happen to any of us in this room, but one never knows. All I'm saying is, he suffered. Jesus suffered because it's not like he was trapped in a place and didn't know anything else. He came down from heaven. And yet, he, did, he lived this life without sin. And if we're honest with ourselves, it is our sin that makes it difficult to put ourselves in other people's shoes. My, my selfishness, my self-interest, my personal agenda makes it so difficult for me to look at someone else I mean, here's, here's what this sin does. I look at somebody else and I'm like, why can't you live life like I do? What? Well, why don't you get a college degree? What's so difficult about that? Right? Why can't you get a GED? What? what I, well, how hard is, I mean, just, but see, that's my selfishness. I can't walk in that person's shoes because I'm so self-oriented. Praise God that Jesus wasn't so self-oriented. He comes down and he counsels us. He, he knows us. Get this. In John 8, we have that story again. We have the story of the poor woman who is caught in, caught in adultery. And I know these verses... Usually in your Bibles, there's some kind of footnote. This story's not in the best manuscripts. But it's in the Bible, whether you like it or not. So these people drag this woman 
that was caught in adultery, not the man, just the woman, and they, they all got rocks in their hands. They're going to stone her, and they bring her before Jesus. And Jesus says this great line. I just love it. The one without sin among you should be the first to throw a stone at her. And they just can't. No one throws a stone at her because they know. They're attuned theologically. They don't believe that they're sinless. So no one throws a stone. They all kind of sneak away into the countryside. Um, and then Jesus turns to her and says, uh, so where are your condemners? Well, there aren't any. He says, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, do not sin anymore. Do you hear the truth and the tears? Jesus has a complete and absolute hate of sin. Let's just be clear about that. He, he can't stand sin. But he also, also has a complete and absolute love and acceptance of the sinner at the same time. We struggle with that reality. We're either a, we're a fixer or a feeler. It's hard to be a fix healer, right? Jesus is a fix healer, and he knows when to do it. So he says, hey, I'm not condemning you. But stop your lifestyle. In the world of the Bible, especially the Old Testament, there are you have kings and you have priests, but you don't have king priests. Because kings represent God to the people, so kings say, you have to do this. Priests represent people to God. Lord have mercy on them. You don't see king priests. But in this text in Hebrews, they refer to someone called Melchizedek. And he's a king priest. And he's back there in Genesis, the opening book of the Bible. And Melchizedek is this person, this personage who comes out of nowhere and disappears into nowhere in, in the Bible. We don't understand who he is. We got no clue. But the writer of Hebrews, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, pulls him out and he says, he's a king priest. Because Abram was asked... Uh, or Jake, I can't remember now, is they're making, he makes sacrifices to the one true God. He is a king priest. But what's going on now in this text is Jesus is like Melchizedek. He is a king and he is a priest. He can do both because he has the ministry of tears and he has the ministry of truth. He will not condemn us, but he will tell us to don't sin anymore. Move on with your life. All right, so let me wrap this up. So how do we get it? To get this kind of counseling, you and I have to be saved. And I'm not talking about a head knowledge that Jesus is my Lord and Savior, and then I just kind of live whatever life I want to live. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you need to believe in Jesus as your Savior, but you also have to believe in Jesus as your counselor. Have you allowed uh, Jesus to see what, uh, what's in your heart? Do you open up your heart to the Lord and just confess to him, Lord, I know that what I'm feeling, thinking, being motivated to do right now is totally contrary to who you are. I need help, Lord. Have you allowed yourself to see what he had to do in order to not condemn you? Because he's not condemning you. The message this morning is, if you're a believer this morning, you are not condemned. And I would argue, if you're not a believer, you're not condemned either. The Lord is reaching out his hand and saying, please, come to me. Trust me. This is not the day of condemnation. So, number one, you have to be a believer. Religion is, this is what religion is. Go and sin no more, and maybe I won't condemn you. Because we've got to see what the future holds yet. Don't know how your life's going to end up. Okay, that's religion. But the gospel says, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. The gospel says, you're not condemned. Because of that love, let that love flow back to you and change the way you live the rest of your life. Do you feel the reality of non-condemnation? Two, communal sanctification. You'll like this. This is verse 313. But encourage each other daily. The Greek word is parakaleo. Para means come alongside. Kaleo means yell. <laughs> so when you come to church, yell. 
So when you come to church, people should sit alongside you and yell at you. That's communal. No, 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 I don't really mean that, but I mean, we need to get exhortation, the exhortation of Jesus through one another. So right now, um, maybe this sermon is touching you in some way. Maybe, you know, it's not me. It's not what's on here. It's the Holy Spirit who's encouraging you, all right? It's never me. But it could be the person sitting next to you in a conversation with you. It could be that you might be the encourager in another situation on another Sunday. And it's not always verbal. Okay, let's get weird here. It's not always verbal. We need to have communal sanctification. It works. In the, this is the major part to me of what the church is. We get together. We don't necessarily agree about everything, but we encourage one another. We converse with one another. We commune with one another. And we find out what the Lord's doing with one another. Amen? Lastly, duration. In this last verse we read, he offered prayers and appeals with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save, and he was heard. What? He was heard? There he is in the garden. Uh, Lord, if it's possible, please let this cup pass from me. Meaning, I don't want to die. Right? And then on the cross he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What do you mean he was heard? He was heard. The tomb is empty. He was raised from the dead. It, he just wasn't heard the way he wanted to be heard. How many times have you prayed? Oh, God's not listening because I didn't get what I want. You know what? Jesus didn't get what he wanted. Have you ever thought about that? You think you're abnormal. I don't get what I want. You hear all these victory stories on TV from preachers. I prayed and I got a Cadillac. I prayed and I got a new house. Well, I don't know what that is. Seriously. I don't know real people who experience that. I, what I know is real people who are in a wilderness called life, who struggle every day, and I don't believe for a minute that that struggle is the fruit of their lack of faith. It is, it is the fruit of a fallen world and trying to live this life as a Christian when the world doesn't like you and you've got a target painted on your back. The duration. If this cup must be, he cries his cries weren't heard or acted upon in a way he thought they would be. He was, but he was resurrected from the death. So here's the deal. Are you in the wilderness? Jesus was in the wilderness. 40 days. He's been where you are. And I would argue we're all in the wilderness. Have you had unanswered prayers? Jesus has had unanswered prayers. Have you felt abandoned? Jesus felt abandoned. Have you felt persecuted? Jesus was persecuted. Whatever you're feeling, I can tell you right now that Jesus had that hit too. And that's why he's our mighty counselor. Because he knows whatever you've been through. And you can take it to him. And he will bring healing through tears and through truth. What we need to pray for is that we would be little versions of him. So that we can do that same ministry. His suffering is redemptive. Everything he suffered gave us salvation, gave us an opportunity to become new creations. The old is gone, the new has come. God hears us today. Don't base silence on the fact that he hasn't heard you. Some of you talk to me and I never respond to you. It doesn't mean that I didn't hear you. I'm just an introvert who doesn't say anything. I'm not saying that's good on my part. It is, but God's not an introvert, so let me not use that. So, as we close, we need to trust in this wonderful counsel. Because he's what we need. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your grace and love and your counsel, your encouragement. And I thank you for this group of people who have been an encouragement to me on a regular basis. And I would pray that folks who are in this group this morning, and even those who couldn't be here this morning, would also find encouragement, tears and truth um, from others as they've surrendered their life to Jesus and, and received that ministry from him through the Holy Spirit. May it get passed on through the rest of us, Lord. We are thankful that we are not alone in the wilderness.
that we have a God who walks with us every step, who knows every temptation that we have, yet has done it without sin, who has not condemned us, but challenges us to live different and empowers us to live different. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.